Hi, everyone. Welcome to the virtual event space of Books and Books, a locally owned independent bookstore here in South Florida. Tonight, we are honored to be hosting our absolute favorite young adult authors as they discuss their latest novels, both out this past Tuesday. Gil Foreman is joining us to discuss We Are Inevitable, and Nicola Yoon is here to discuss Instructions for Dancing. Um, if you don't know yet, I do want to share that Gail Foreman and Penguin Young Readers are donating a portion of the first week sale of We Are Inevitable to Bink's Survive to Thrive fundraising campaign, which is working to support independent bookstores and booksellers like us across the country. And in addition to that, tonight one of you guys, one of the lucky registered attendees, are, is going to be chosen to receive a $100 gift card to us, Books and Books. Um, so, um, I will go ahead and read their bios quickly and then we'll get started with uh, the evening's um, adventure. Okay, Gail Foreman is an award-winning, internationally best-selling author and journalist. She is the author of Just One Day and Just One Year and the companion e-novella Just One Night, as well as the New York Times bestsellers If I Stay and Where She Went. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and daughters. Nicola Yoon is the author of the instant New York Times number one bestseller, Everything Everything. She grew up in Jamaica and Brooklyn. She currently resides in Los Angeles with her husband and their daughter, both of whom she loves beyond all reason. And tonight, this conversation will be moderated by Frolic Media's YA expert, Aurora Lydia Dominguez. Aurora is a journalist, high school teacher, and college professor based in Hollywood, Florida. Her bookish pieces and Sunday brunch interviews can be found on Frolic Media and Book Riot. And her passions include reading a book on Saturday mornings with her cat Luna, time with her husband Sebastian, and <laughs> pop rock shows. Um, before I hand this over to Aurora, Nicola, and um, Gail, a, a couple of quick things about your screen. The first is that the big green button directly below us, um, this one will take you to purchase copies of We Are Inevitable and Instructions for Dancing. We do have uh, signed copies of both books and uh, signed book plates thereafter. So if you have any questions about that, um, you can uh, leave a note in the order comments before checking out and we'll get back to you. And then the second is that for the Q&A portion, if you could please use the ask a question button, it's um, to the right of your screen says ask a question so that you're um you can, we will ask them in just a little bit all right and that's it from me <laughs> you guys in a little bit thank you so much guys it's such an honor to be with you tonight um i was very excited when they told me i was going to moderate both of you um as you can see i have both books right here and i adore them and i am so happy to be here with gail and nicola so we're gonna start talking a little bit about the books, okay? So maybe Gail can kick this off. So what inspired your books and what can fans expect from the story? So I started this book four or five years ago and it was a very different book, but I think it had the same inspiration, which is Aaron at the start of the book is kind of obsessed with the period of time in between the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs hitting and the last mm -hmm. dinosaur dying, which was 33,000 years, <laughs> which sounds like forever, but you know, in, in universal time, it's not so much. But he thinks about that period of time, like what happens like when your way of life has been destroyed and you're just kind mm -hmm. of waiting for everything to end. He and his father run a failing used bookstore mm -hmm. and that's exactly how he feels. And so I really wanted to write a book that showed men and, and, and particularly white men who had seen their sort of way of life um, change sort of overnight in some cases and realized that there was a way forward. I wanted to kind of write a hopeful tale about these people who kind of come together, this ragtag community that comes together after life as they've always known it changes and instead of kind of wallowing in the bitterness and self-pity, they come together as a community and they figure a path forward. Of course, there's a bookstore at the center mm -hmm. of it. And I think one of um, one of the blurbs, E. Lockhart said that the book is like a warm hug. So I feel like that's what I want Aww. to take away from it. Beautiful. And Nicola, how about you? Your instructions for dancing just came up as came out as well this week. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, but I just want to agree with Emily Lockhart that um, it is. Like a <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Okay. I read it on my trip to Puerto Rico. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um. So, got instructions for dancing. I started a version of this book about four years ago as well. Wow. Um. I then my family. I 
got really sick. So my mom was diagnosed with cancer um, and my father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer and he died. And so it was, I was writing mm. during this period where we were just dealing with so much. Um, mm -hmm. and, and one of the questions I kept asking myself is why do we do this? Like, why do we love people when we're mm. gonna love them? Like, it's just <laughs> terrible, love is terrible. <laughs> Um, and so, I mean, it's like big and, and, and transcendent and wonderful, but oh my God, heartbreak is miserable. Oh so, my God, yes. I mean, and I'm joking about it now, but you know, like going through that and watching my mother-in-law lose her husband of 40 years and, and my dad potentially lose his wife. Mm. And it was just it was crazy, all this grief. And I really could not work through, you know, why we open ourselves up when the pain is so severe. Um, so anyway, so I was asking myself, what's love worth? <laughs> and is it worth the heartbreak? Mm -hmm. And so I made Evie, who's the main character of the book, go through that, right? So Evie is this wonderful romantic and she loves her romance books um, until she becomes quite cynical because her favorite couple breaks up and her favorite couple are her parents. Um, and mm -hmm. so the dad cheats on the mom and they break up. So Evie is very cynical when we meet her, she's giving away her romance books and she meets this <laughs> mysterious woman who gives her a superpower. And the superpower is that whenever she sees a couple kiss, she sees the entire history of their relationship, right? So she sees like the happy beginning, the very content, Aww. and then the end. And what she takes away from this is, everything ends, love sucks, it's not worth it. And then she meets the super cute rock star boy <laughs> who challenges <laughs> And right, who they ballroom dance, he's six inches from her face, and she has to try to resist him. So that is the book. <laughs> I love it. Oh. Both beautiful stories. So beautiful. Oh my God. And just talking about grief, um, the books deal deal with these themes about grief and loss and getting to know yourself. Um, why do you think it's important to write about these topics? Gail, you can start talking about that a little bit. You know, I was thinking when I was reading Nikki's book of uh, whenever she has these flashes, it reminded mm -hmm. me of the opening sequence of Up, which is one of the most beautiful sequences oh. ever. Because, oh, well, you pulled it off because there's one particular vignette there where you see a lifetime in like mm -hmm. six or seven tiny little vignettes. And it, was, it made me think there were so many beautiful lines from your book. And I think the thing about grief, and I'm totally stealing this line from WandaVision because I wish I'd written it, but it's what is, what is grief if not love persevering, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is why grief is something that you can't write about love without writing about the flip side of it, the, the aftermath of losing it, what happens, like where do you put your love when the person you loved isn't there anymore? So I think anybody who's been through that or even anybody who hasn't, because when you love somebody, you, you, you automatically go there. And I think novelists are particularly guilty of going to it, but Nikki sort of hearing what you went through, that sort of mm -hmm. love, melancholy, and the kind of the, the yin and the yang of it both, just really, it's sort of everywhere in your book and it made me, I was, we were talking before we all came on about how we had in very different ways written very similar books. Yeah. Because Aaron is grappling with that too. Right, no, I and mean, he is, I mean, and I think, I think it's something that we all eventually grapple with, right? Because that's the problem, right? Is that eventually we lose these people we um, that we love. And, you know, I, one of the things that occurred to me early on when I was writing the book was that the opposite of love isn't hate, it's death. Um, and I, mm. so that, that, I, I was pretty sure I was in the hospital when I thought of that um, with my mom, like we were going for like an infusion or something. And, and that was, I mean, I really felt that it's the absence, right? It isn't that you're hating someone, it's that you don't have them anymore. Um, and so, I mean, it's important. I mean, I don't know if I think it's important to write about grief so much as mm -hmm. I need to write about grief, right? So mm -hmm. those, of different. Um, I needed to try to answer this question, which is, you know, is it worth it to open yourself up so much? The so heart. I just want to hide. <laughs> and I still kind of <laughs> And I feel like I need to put a disclaimer here that Nikki's book is swoony and romantic, and I hope my book is funny. <laughs> so it's not like you're like reading these <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> <laughs> 
Dave, my husband, was reading Gail's book for blurbing, and he was laughing. And Dave is such a snob, and like he never anything is funny or anything. And it's like, what are you reading? And he's like, this book is funny. And I was like, no one writes funny. And he's like, yeah, but Gail writes funny. This is funny. So it absolutely is, and I think so too. To be clear, Love it. And yours, and not only is yours swoony, but not surprisingly, it was so deep. I, I underlined quite a it few is. lines there. It's like very profound what it has to say about love. Beautiful. And I also see Gail, this is first question for you. Music plays a huge role in your story. Um, tell us about that. And do you have a playlist of songs you listen to while writing this book at all? And then Nicola as well, is there, do you listen to music while writing? Like how does music involve and get together with your writing process? Um, so I always write, or not always, but I often have music in my books. I think I fell in love with a musician, so for me, music and love are the same language. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really, this time, Aaron, when the book starts, he very much does not like music. He, his older brother, Sandy, was a big music guy, a big record collector, and Sandy has died of his, his opioid addiction. Aaron mm -hmm. is very angry at him, and he defines himself in opposition to Sandy, so he does not like music. Mm -hmm at all. He thinks books and music are completely different. This starts to change when he starts sort of secretly selling Sandy's record collection and he meets this musician, Hannah. And she is a big reader and a big um, and a musician. And I really, what I was sort of exploring within this idea of the perfect song, which to me, I always equate in my head to a book. Because when I sit down mm -hmm. and write a book, I know what a perfect song is. It's very subjective, but I know when I hear it, I'm like, why doesn't every musician write a perfect song every time? But it's the same when you sit down <laughs> and write a book, like I hear the perfect song and getting it there is another story. So it was really fun to have these two characters, one of whom disavows music to kind of understand how books and music are both different ways of telling a story. And I'm not just talking about lyrically. I think you get at this with the dancing yes. in your book too, Nikki, yes. is there's an emotional pacing to music and to song that takes you on a journey. Um, and, and you have the added element of the dance to the physicality. So I really, it was a fun way to kind of go against type. I didn't have a musician. I had somebody who hated music or so he claimed. And for him to kind of come to realize that <laughs> it's meaningful. And in terms of what I listened to, I listened to all the talking heads. I was a huge talking nice. head when I was younger. And I went back to it also to the magnetic fields. So uh, they were definitely part of it. Another funny similarity. Amazing. How about you, Nicola? Do you listen to music? Is there, I mean, instructions for dancing, obviously music, like the music brings something into your writing when it came to this book? Um, a little bit, but I just want to talk about, just say something to what Gail was just saying about sure. music. I have this idea that mm -hmm. one day I want to write a book as immediate as like your favorite pop song. <laughs> Yes. David and I argue about this all the time. And he says you can't because they are different mediums. And he's right, right? It's just different. That like the economy mm -hmm. and the sound, um, like a three minute pop song, you just can't pull it off. But like, is there anything so immediate as just like listening to that song that you love so much you just sort of have to stop and listen to it and like I just want to pull that off, but I don't think I can. There is literally like a 45 second riff in a Mumford and Sons song that when I hear, I'm like, if any of my books can do what this 45 minute riff does, then, then, I'm, then I've done my job. So hey. I'm glad you do that. I, I support you on that. I on, totally on that objective. Yes. Really just, I, and it's also because I can't. Like I'm not musical at all. So like, I find it so mysterious, you know? Um, it's the same way I find fine art really mysterious because I cannot draw for any for anything. Um, but in terms of music, I can't really listen to anything when I'm writing because I find it really, like I will just write the song basically. <laughs> I'm easily swayed, <laughs> you know? So like, I just can't do it. Um, I listen to thunderstorms on my headphones. Like I have like these giant headphones and I just listen to that. But I do have a playlist of, of songs that get me in the mood for writing. So like, I, I mean, I just keep a bunch of songs that I'm listening to on a playlist. And, you know, if eventually Random House says, do you have a playlist? And I go, yes, I do. <laughs> I have you. <laughs> nice. And when it comes to your characters, um, is there like a character that was 
that just came to you and that conversation was there and you created this character, it was easy. Um, and was there like a character that was harder to write in this novel? Gil, you can start. I would say Chad and Ira, who's like a 60 something year old lumberjack. They came <laughs> to me. I could have just had them like overtake every single scene because I just so enjoyed the banter and <laughs> they were on the page. They were fun. Yeah. They were they were delightful. And then um, you know, I would say Aaron was hard to write because it's hard to write a character that is embittered by his by his grief and loss, you know, and still be and is doing all these stupid, terrible things and have sympathy with him. So it it was, you know, tricky to write him. I think when when I had Hannah as a foil, um, it, it became and Chad as a foil, it was easier, but in the beginning sort of catching Aaron, you know, that was that was tricky. How about you, Nicola? I mean I agree with Gail about sort of writing a cynical character is hard, right? Because you <laughs> You want to? I don't. I don't want to say you want to make him likable, but you want to empathize, right? And like someone who is uh, sort of hates everything is hard to empathize with sometimes, right? So like, I think the edit note I got every time was, "Oh my God, <laughs> calm Evie down. <laughs> like, what is her problem?" And like, her problem is her dad cheated on her mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. so oh I yeah. Um, her hurt was so relatable and so sympathetic. It was very right. really rendered. Well, thank you, but that's because my editor is smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the character that was more fun to write was Fifi, who is the dance instructor in the book. Nice. It's like <laughs> she's hilarious. Like I, she just popped into my head wholesale. I don't know where she came. <laughs> she's like vaguely Eastern European, like from a country that does not exist. Um, and she says what's up on whatever is on her mind and she's kind of mean and I love her so much because I am not mean <laughs> and I would never say the things that she does. So it was kind of free and she just go, whatever, she'll just say and that. Go for it, yeah. <laughs> and then I her, she was just like, whatever, that's what Evie would say. And she made me laugh out loud. There's there's a scene where she's equating dancers to like they look like they're having sex, and it's like she says good <laughs> sex. It's just to clarify. Anything that made me laugh with her, I just kept. I was just like, whatever. That's what she said. No, she was so funny. <laughs> Amazing. And so, Gil, you said that your book is like a love letter to booksellers. I mean, I'm a big indie bookstore fan. Hello, guys, books and books. Go buy their books at books and books. Um, but let's talk about everything that's been going on nowadays. Uh, what role have booksellers had in your career? Um, and do you have any memorable bookstore and book tour moments? Because we've been there. Like, we've been to different bookstores. Um, what role have they they played, and exactly what memories do you have that are very exciting from those times, Gail? Sure. So I will say, you know, I started this book back when pandemics were the stuff of sort of sci-fi dystopian, and then <laughs> one of the last things I did out in the world was meet my editor for my editorial editor, and so I spent the spring when New York City, which is where I live, was just deep in it and there was just sirens all the time and the nightly seven o'clock claps and all of that stuff. I spent working on this book. And I, of course, always loved bookstores, particularly indie bookstores, even before as, as a reader, they've always been so amazing with the hand sell and give me things I wanna read. But as an author, they are incredible boosters, but something about not being able to go into them and being, cloistered in my home. It, it really, I think it changed the book and it changed me because I understood or I remembered anew just the role that books, bookstores like Books and Books play because they don't just sell you books or sell your books, but they're these, these great good places, so they're called, these, these spaces in our community where we, we can come together. And I missed that so acutely. And it became like the highlight when I could go to my little local bookstore that stayed open and only last week open for browsing, but I would order a bunch of books and they'd hand me my bag. So I was really feeling so connected to, to bookstores knowing that this was going to be another asteroid they were gonna to have to weather. Um, so that's part of the reason of, of the big campaign and trying to kind of focus so much on encouraging everybody to shop at their indie booksellers, to buy from their indie booksellers. And one of the most amazing, I think, 
book events was was actually with you all at the Coral Gables location, and I, it was for If I Stay for the paperback tour, and they had musicians, they had cellists and musicians come out, and it was all these young people. And so the way that you can sort of take a book beyond just sort of just this two-dimensional paper and ink and create it into this world and the way the bookstores become the place for that, like, it's so special. And how about you, Nicola? Do you have a favorite bookstore moment? I mean, there are just so many, right? I mean, all my launches have been at Vroman's. I, I think two at Vroman's, maybe one at Ripped Bodice. Um, and I, I think I relate more as a, like a reader when I go in. I have never gotten as good recommendations anywhere as when you go to an indie bookstore. I mean, like, booksellers know what they're doing, right? They know what they're talking about. And like one of my favorite moments was for my little girl actually, right? So we went in and uh, I think we went into Froman's and I wanted something for her. And she's like really kind of a tomboy. She likes swords and she likes magic and whatever. And the bookseller just like, you need to read this book. She gave her the okay witch. And when I tell you my child inhaled this book, it's ridiculous. She loves it so much. And we just always were like, okay, well, this is what we're doing now. Cause you know, like the recommendations on the internet are not as good as someone saying, I see you, here's what you should read, right? So I think that's the most incredible thing about indie bookstores is that it's peopled by people who love books and want you to love them too, right? Yes, definitely. I agree. I mean, they just, they're such a big part of our lives and it's so important to support them. Um, and when it comes to your novels, thinking about different scenes that you wrote, is there a scene, no spoilers, of course, is there a scene that kind of stands out for you um, as a favorite from your current novel, Gail? I think so. I think it's a scene with Aaron and Chad. And so Chad, as mentioned, he's one of my favorite characters. He was somebody Aaron describes as like a best life bro. He's like one of those total backward baseball hat bros, not very nice to Aaron previously, he's a couple years older than him. But Chad, a couple of years before, was at a snowboarding accident and he broke his neck and he uses a wheelchair now. And it has, it has sort of made him sort of in a minority for the first time in his life. And, and Chad has kind of leaned into that. And he's this sort of this very intersectional character who, who really starts to think about what masculinity means and how hard it is, how hard it was for him to kind of have to keep, you know, keep up with the whole sort of ruse. And so there's a scene after Aaron and Chad don't get in to see a show after this jerk of a bouncer won't let them in and they're driving home. And, you know, Chad is kind of talking about how like guys like that bouncer who are so aggro, they're scared. And, and you know, Aaron says, they have this whole conversation and Aaron's like, do you really believe that? And Chad says, I'm trying to. And I really, you know, I, I am married to a man who is sensitive and warm hearted and great around the house and, you know, performs masculinity in a very different way, and I love it. And I wanted to have these characters kind of look at, you know, all the different ways that you can be male. Beautiful. Nicola, how about you? Is there a specific scene that kind of lives in your head that you really enjoyed writing? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm not sure if I enjoyed writing it, <laughs> um, but I did write it. It's at, towards the end. I can't say what it is because it's a spoiler, but this scene was in my head and it's a thing I was driving towards the whole time. And every revision I was trying to earn that scene at the end, like I was just like, cause it was such an emotional scene and the book never quite seemed to earn it. You know, like I, there wasn't, I didn't, I would not get to write that scene unless I changed the whole rest of the book. So I kept, that was what I kept revising so I could get to the scene. So you could believe the things I say in this scene, right? Cause I wrote it at, towards the very beginning. And I basically, I was just trying to get there the whole time. Um, so it's my favorite scene. It's quite sad. I can't tell you what it is. I think I know <laughs> at least one. <laughs> the scenes at the we end know. are all just masterpiece gut punches. So oh, thank you, Gail. <laughs> Awesome. So I, I, one thing that I love is like how, like I, being here, I see how supportive you guys are of each other and of other writers. Why do you think a mentorship when it comes to writing is so important to get those juices flowing? Gail. I just, I like reading books that make me feel and, and mm -hmm. I like reading books where I can feel the generous heart. I mean, I think anybody who knows 
Nicola in any context knows that she's such a generous person, but you feel it throbbing out of the pages of her books. So, I mean, obviously, anytime I have a chance to, to commune with her, I, I, I want to. And, you know, I with in children's books and in young adult publishing, like I find that has been by and large, very typical. It's always been maybe because we kind of sit off at the children's table and the kids table at Thanksgiving, a very <laughs> supportive group. And, um, and I'm missing people in person. So this is just like a huge treat to be able to even kind of get on a, you know, crowd cast like this. Awesome. Nicola, how about you? Well, I mean, look, I am, we're here with, okay, Yay. with Gail Foreman. Like, you don't understand. Yes, I know. <laughs> that's be, like, that's look, a big I deal. Do, I remember seeing Gail at events going, holy shit. Sorry, <laughs> that's Gail Foreman. And I mean, you know, She's been so kind and generous over the years. And I think that you can you, you can see that, right? I mean, she's amazing. Yes. Um, and some people aren't like that, to be honest, mm -hmm. right? Not, not everyone is like that. Not everyone is welcoming um, and generous with their time. And, you know, just even tonight, right? Like sometimes you do these events and like the other author just wants to talk about them and they just don't. It's like, <laughs> And so no, I, I just want to talk about your book. I'm sick of talking about mine. <laughs> I mean, I think you can see her spirit, right? I mean, and it's so wonderful. Yeah. And anyway, this is part of the job, right? I mean, I love books. I want more books. So let's get some more writers in the world. More books. Oh my God, for sure. <laughs> You're always office, right? Because I love to read. So, like, and I, I mean, I just want to also say I love Nicola's books. She's an amazing writer. I also love. I'm so excited about Blackout. I love, I'm so excited about Joy Revolution, this idea that black stories are stories of joy and love and celebration. So it's it's so important so for so many reasons that these are these are out in the world. So it's it's just wonderful to read stories like this. And speaking of books, um, do you have a book that you're currently reading or something you're looking forward to read that you'd like to recommend, Gail? I am reading so many different things right now. So I'm reading <laughs> Me too. new shows Better Together, which is a sister Aww. story, which I love. Um, and I just started li down listening to um, Somebody's Daughter on audio. How about you, Nicola? Anything you're reading right now that you're excited about? Um, well, I just got One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston. Yes, which I got that too. Oh, wait, that's a summer read. Right. I was saving it because I'm going on vacation for like a week and a half or something. And I'm saving it for there because I need to read it. Um, I just read um Jasmine Guillory's new one, which is not out till July, called While We Were Dating. I think I don't want to screw it up. Yeah, while we were dating. And it's awesome. I'm looking forward to Tiffany Jackson's White Smoke, which is coming out in the fall. Um, what else? I think that's it for now. Oh, oh I'm going to do an early plug. I just read Nina LaCour's book, which is not coming out until February. Oh. Book book, Yerba Buena, and it is so good. That's the one I was going to say. Oh, so good. So I need it. You have to please. I, you know, I'll just do it. I'll send you my copy. I'll send it to you. I love her writing so, so good. intensely. And I die for that book. I can't get it in my hands soon enough. She's brilliant. Yeah, she's brilliant. She's really and I, amazing. Best yet, so it's so good. So everybody, wow. February twenty twenty two. Put that in there. Nina Lacour's new book. Written. Yeah. And um, so before we go to audience questions, we have a selection of audience questions. I'm so excited. Um, what's up next for you in the literary world that you can share? What's up next for you, Gail, that you can share? I understand sometimes you can't share your no, what's going I can't on. Share because I have my my middle grade debut comes oh. out in October. It's called Frankie and Bug. It is the book of my heart. It is oh. set in 1987 in Venice Beach. It's the first time I've written about my hometown of LA, and it's about these these two kids over the course of the summer. So that comes out in a few months. Nice. How about nice. you, Nicola? Oh. That sounds adorable. I love that. <laughs> How about you, Nicola? What do you have anything you can share that's coming up? Or as publishing is. <laughs> okay, just the, <laughs> and I, um David and I are working on something together and we're having a great time doing it. That's all I could say. Nice. That sounds exciting. 
Yeah. So let's go to some audience questions. I'm so excited. I'm seeing some questions here. So let's see. We have one from Megan. Um, both of you had had books adapted into movies. Does that influence how you write the following books? Um, I'll start. I mean, it does not for me, um, just because my big dream has always been to write books, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that I want. But I mean, that's meant to be like movies getting made is awesome because they sell more books. <laughs> but I love books, right? And I remember when. I think it was when everything, everything had been adapted. Someone at the movie studio asked me if I wanted to write screenplays. And I was like, no, never. I want nothing to do with it. And they were so surprised. And I was like, I don't, I want to sit in my room with my books. <laughs> right. And anyway, I don't think that way. I don't think visually, I think in like monologue and dialogue. And so it really, really wouldn't work. But um, so it does not influence. I mean, I'm intensely grateful, but it doesn't change the way I write at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I clearly have no um, instinct for which thing would actually be a good adaptation, because if you'd asked me, like, which is the least likely of my films, the books to be made into a film would be If I Stay. And I when they first said, oh, we're going to send this out to Hollywood to get adapted, I'm like, well, have fun with that. I mean, it's this book. <laughs> it's super internal. <laughs> She's in a coma. <laughs> so I don't know anything and I don't think you can gain that. I think you just, you write the best book you can that channels whatever it is you're going through at the moment and you try and be as honest and authentic and, and then it's out of your, it's out of your hands at that point. I don't think if you, if I wanted to, I would even know how to do that. Yeah. And there's a question here for Nicola from Elena Alvarez. Um, what does your process look like when you have two authors in the same household <laughs> writing? <laughs> I love it. Um, so, you know, David and I actually met in graduate school uh, back when we were very young, because now we're a thousand years old. Um, and so it's easy, it's easy for two of us to be writing in the household because we always have been, right? Like that is how we met and that is how I first knew him. But to like, the very first time I met him was outside of our first creative writing class in graduate school. And the first, the reason I first liked him is because I thought that boy can write, like he's just such a good writer. So it's like, it's just kind of who we are. Like we share stories, we write stories. Um, so it's like, it's just part of our marriage, honestly, and a part of our friendship. I love that. I'm a little so, jealous. I, I, I have to rely on my my other spouse, Libba Bray, to sort of be the person I can read stuff aloud to. <laughs> I feel like Libba is a good spouse to have. Okay, I'll, I mean, <laughs> I feel pretty lucky. This is a question for the both of you from Christina. What was the hardest part about writing instructions for dancing and We Are Inevitable? Gail. <laughs> so the you know we talked about sort of modulating a, a cynical um, main character, but I think with Aaron with that book the hardest thing was like the mechanics of it. Aaron has this big secret that he has to sort of keep up, um, and and you had to kind of make it believable that he keeps you know, not telling his father that he's done this thing or that things keep getting in the way. So making that feel like it wasn't just the writer's hand mechanically doing it, but that it was really his avoidance. That mm -hmm. that was that was kind of tricky to write. And then um <laughs> about a bit of Hannah stuff with him too. Yes. You know, Hannah went through a bunch of different iterations. And I don't want to go too into why it was hard because it's a spoiler. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, like, I know that was hard, and you pulled it off beautifully. Like, I know yeah, that's beautiful. You know, it was secret, like, because you have to make it about the character and not about like external things, right? But you believe you you absolutely believe that Aaron would do this. So, I mean, anyway, you know, you're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> You know how it is. It's like it's not there, and you just go draft by draft by draft by draft by draft. There's no magic to it. It's just work. Yeah, it is. Um, and Nicola, for you, yes. I mean, I think the hardest thing was just my personal life, honestly, right? Um, I've been talking about 
instructions for dancing. But before this book, I wrote another book that will never see the light of day. So I wrote, it took two years and it failed, right? It just was not. Um, and I revised it 11 billion times and it did not work. Um, and it had no daylight in it. It was just all grief, right? So like I could not get the character to arc. I could not give her any joy. I could not, like I just, it was just me being sad. <laughs> basically for two years. Um, and I think that was the hardest part was like just putting that book aside and, and you know, and saying, okay, I gotta, I have to move on. And then there were sort of many false starts until I got to instructions for dancing and emotionally to think, oh my God, what if I spend another two years and this book doesn't go anywhere? Right? Because writing is also a business and like my kid needs to go to college, right? So like there is a that's like, if I can't do this, so like this is my this is how I make a living, right? So um, emotionally, it was really difficult to like sort of yes. get this, and and it's taking a chance when you're right, right? I mean, I think Gail can talk about this too. I mean, there is so much risk in just writing and 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 hoping that the thing comes together eventually. And we have a quick question from Stacy Letterberg. When it comes to your books, do you have a specific age range that you recommend would pick up these novels? I, mean, I feel like anybody. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I, mm -hmm. I will I will speak for Nikki's book. Like it's it's little steamy in places, but it's just it's delightful, I think, for <laughs> any young person or old person, anyone in between. I'm gonna say, I would say mine, you know, there's definitely some a trigger warning maybe around a drug use, um, but it definitely does not glamorize drug use. I think it's it's really about mm -hmm. when, like when you are the family member of somebody dealing with addiction, which unfortunately I think is all too mm -hmm. common in this country. Mm -hmm. So I, again, and I also think that readers read as they're ready to read. And so a 12 yes. year old will read a book in a very different way than a 15 year old or a 20 year old, et cetera. Yeah. Nice. And you know your own child, you know, like I know, like my little girl reads things that are older, but I know who she mm -hmm. is. So um, I, I think you have to, you know, sort of make that gauge. But, you know, all of our books are pretty wholesome. You're fine. Awesome. <laughs> I agree. So this question is from Julien, 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 um, about your writing process. What does your writing process consist of and how do you refresh your creativity when you need to find new story elements and come across writer's block? I, I, you know, I want to talk about the kind of, I think most people think writer's block is like sitting in front of your computer and not being able to write. And I've experienced it more as you had it where you're writing on something and it just feels like metal against metal and, and having to put, pull books aside or to go back to the very beginning or start again. But I have several books on my hard drive that will never see the light of day for some of the reasons you mentioned. So, you know, I, I think that's part of the process, but writing a novel when you sit down to do it is to use asking yourself these questions. And as you answer one, another one gets asked and characters come in and sometimes like with Fifi or with Chad, they're there fully formed right away. And other times it's like getting to know a person. And so it is, again, it's the draft after draft and the inspiration, like to me, the muse does not strike when I'm out on a beautiful walk. It strikes when I'm like sitting at my desk and I'm typing and there's a brick wall and then all of a sudden there's a window. It's just how it happens. And it's, it's just a practice. It's like getting up every morning, getting my coffee, sitting down, getting to work. Yeah, I How about you, Nicola? <laughs> everything Gail said. I mean, I do think writing is a muscle, absolutely, and it needs practice. Um, and so, you know, I write like five days a week, and I'm not saying that everyone has to do this because whatever gets words on the page for you is the thing you should do. Um, but for me, I, I consistency is key. So, you know, if I'm first drafting, I get up really early because I don't know why, right? And I write it by hand into notebooks and also don't know why. And and then I do that for five days a week until there's a book. Um, so the me, notebooks in your TikTok were real. Oh my God, yeah, I absolutely. I thought that was just like you trying to like show up. Oh. Wow. Look, see these books I have. Oh my God, you write by hand, that's incredible. Yeah. For real. Beautiful. <laughs> so like, <laughs> 
instructions for dancing is 12 notebooks. And I think everything, everything was like seven or eight. Oh, oh, wow. No, that was sun. Anyway, whatever. I write by hand. Um, <laughs> but I know I do it early in the morning. And that's just how I do it, right? But the best advice I think I've ever heard is like, whatever gets you to write your book is the process that you should do and write your book. And we have a message from Mitchell. He says, thank you both. And thank you, Gail, for writing about a bookstore and always being so supportive of us and indies everywhere. Your contribution to BINC is so wonderful. Nicola and Gail hope to see you both at the Miami Book Fair sooner rather than later. That's really Me nice. Too. <laughs> I love the book fair. So we have a really nice question here. Both of you ladies suck me in every time and make me cry. How do you do that? <laughs> and that's from Kristen Valenzuela. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we're powered by reader tears. It's like our superpower. <laughs> I have a rare dis disorder that if I don't get an infusion of reader tears, I, I will die. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I mean, that's really sweet. And I think one of the things, if we're not feeling anything when we're writing, you're not feeling anything either, right? So mm -hmm. um, if it's any consolation, we are also sad when we write those sad mm -hmm. scenes. <laughs> yeah. I think what you talked about earlier, it was really telling about wanting, needing to earn that scene. And I feel like you read books when you know that the characters haven't earned it and the writer hasn't earned it. It doesn't feel, but when you, when you read a book where it's done well, you are along for the ride. You you forget who you are and you become who the character is. And I think that's how it is when we're writing, which is not to say it's always mm -hmm. like that. It's just you keep revising and revising until you get to those moments. And often, like sometimes you get a magic book where it's like that, but most of the time it's, you know, you'll be working, 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 revising, and then you'll have like a half hour breakthrough and it will just come through. And I feel like when it's coming, when I'm feeling it, when I'm writing it, you're going to feel it when you're reading it. And if I'm bored when I'm writing, you're going to be mm -hmm. bored when you're reading. I mean, yeah. I think that Gail has talked about this a few times now, and it's really true. Like, books are revision, right? Like, I don't have a career because I'm good at first drafting. I have a career because I'm good at revising, and I'm willing yeah. to do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to sit there, and I'll revise it again, and I'll revise it again, and again. And most of the the good stuff is like revision four, right? Like it, the first draft is terrible. It's terrible and not worth the paper it's written on, honestly. But I will revise it to death. Um, and that's important. I think it's something that's really um, aspiring writers ought to know is that we suck at the beginning and then we just <laughs> <laughs> until it's not bad. But you know what, I'm guessing this is true with you because I've read your work and it's so perfect, is that you have a very good instinct of knowing when you're not there and knowing when you're there. And and also not being willing to let something out, you know, you're not being willing to say book is done when you're not feeling that it's there. Mm -hmm. I, mean, that, I mean, I definitely think the second part is true. Like I won't, like I can tell when it's good, you know, but Honestly, it's my editor. Like, I'm not. I'm not being like you know. I'm modest. Like she literally is smarter than I am. <laughs> so she <laughs> fixes my stuff. She's like, "Yay, for editors!" <laughs> Lila Sales edited has edited, edited the last like five of my YA books, and she. I kept hot potatoing this off. I'm like, I'm done, and she'd like send it back. I was like, Lila. <laughs> <laughs> But they're so great, but so mad <laughs> Yeah, they make you work really hard. <laughs> oh my God. And we have a question about book covers. So this is from Christina. Were you involved in the design or were you pleasantly surprised? They're both gorgeous. Book covers. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that people are often surprised by is how little say writers have in book covers. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's different for you, Gail, but for me, like it's for everything and everything, and the sun is also a star. Like they just showed me, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> like I just love those covers so much. And then with instructions for dancing, I was a little bit more involved. But it's just been—I'm not a visual person that way, so I need someone to show me, and I'll go, "Oh, you're a genius, right?" So, yes, I <laughs> don't want to demonstrate. So. Um, you know, this one immediately we we absolutely loved. They they showed me this sort of whole the meteorites and, and the, the lettering, which I loved. 
And then um, this illustrator named Anna Ruprecht did these, these illustrations. I got involved because it's such a big cast of characters. And I'm like, I really wanted to have more characters sort of on the jacket. So I said, don't use an author photo this time, you know, to the real estate. So we could get like Chad in on the flap. I was excited to get Chad in. And then we got like one of the lumberjacks back there and like some little spot art of books and records. Um, and, and Nikki's super sweetie David with an amazing blurb. Um, <laughs> So in this case, I, I did. I, you know, they had the design, but I was like, can we just bring more, more of the we of it all? Because it really is such this big cast of unruly characters that we wanted to, to show that. So, I mean, I think that I actually did one was just characters on the cover. So like this, all of this stuff. This was my only suggestion: is like, can we have some people <laughs> like on the cover? And this was done by an artist named Renee Kay. Um, and I love these dancers so, so Even much. Even the, 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 the blue tips yes. of the so box are just like oh, Yeah, I actually really love the braids. Yeah, like, yeah, the way they're like, it's very, it's very like dancer-esque. It's like an arabesque of braids. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And the, uh, I think we have time for one more question. So this is from Elena. She said, I heard one time that the opposite of love is indifference, which is interesting. I love this topic, by the way. How do you write books when you're going through sad and difficult moments in your own life? Do you feel like writing helps you get through that? Um, I'm gonna say that, you know, like I said before, I wrote a book that while I was really in the thick of it, that was terrible. I mean, it's just not a good book. I mean, and I, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say like, the writing is fine. It's just that mm -hmm. there's no, there's just no sunshine in that book. There is like, there just isn't an arc. Like it's just thick with grief and there is no way into it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, for me, writing isn't therapy. For me, therapy is therapy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and I needed to write that book to get here. Uh, I write to answer a question in my own head, but I don't write for like, it doesn't help me therapeutically. It just helps me process, which Got is it. different in a way, I think. I, I don't think I'm being particularly eloquent, but that's it, that's all. <laughs> Gil, have you ever, how about you? Yeah, no, I mean, I think writing helps me work through whatever I'm going through at a certain point in my life. And often I don't see what it is until after the fact. And so in that way, it is incredibly cathartic. But yes, it's it's not therapy. I mean, sometimes joke is therapy, but therapy is a specific kind of work that you do, um, which I think, you know, leads to self-awareness and makes you better at writing sometimes. But no, it, it's, it's an emotionality that I think is reflective of, I don't know how it can't be reflective of, whatever your sort of current state is and that is sort of what is coming through and that will change sort of based upon places you are in your life and and sometimes mm -hmm. lead to work that um you know you realize i'm sure you could have published that book i'm sure your publisher would have put it out but i think like you and your your instinct mm -hmm. and your heart of hearts like knew like this is not something i want to put out and that's a lot to do after two two years of work two years that's it's a long time, right? yeah. And it's easy to like lose, it's easy to have fear and lose heart. You talk about the, yes. the, the leap of faith, like, am I gonna find a book? And I feel like I, you have to take that leap of faith every time you start a new book. Every time, Gail. Oh my God, why did we do this to ourselves? Like, <laughs> I don't know, stop it. <laughs> well, ladies, this has been a beautiful night. I am so honored to have been here with both of you. Thank you so much. Guys, pick up We Are Inevitable. Pick up instructions for dancing at Books and Books, please. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you. This was so much fun. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank so you. much fun. Amazing. <laughs> thank you, Gail. So nice to see you. I can't wait to see everybody in person. Thank you, guys. Oh, so I know, much. me too. I'm hugging you all. Thank you all for joining us tonight, spending some time of some of your Friday night with us. Thank you to everyone in the audience and especially everyone who uh, submitted wonderful questions. Um, thank you to uh, Penguin Young Readers and Gail for thinking of working with Bink. That was really great. And um, we're so excited to have hosted both of you and been a part of your 
um, launch week for these wonderful new novels. We've followed you for years and years. We hope to host you again soon, hopefully in person. Um, and to everyone who's watching, we've got lots of YA events coming up. Um, and YA and adult, a huge June. So if you'd like to follow Books and Books, you can um, do so at booksandbooks.com or by uh, finding us on social or subscribing to our email list. And with that, I hope everyone has a lovely weekend. And thank um, <laughs> again, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.